Good, uh, good evening and uh, welcome to the 11th uh, session of the Mahamana case discussion series. And uh, today's discussion will be on the parotid tumors. And to begin with, we have Dr. Sanskriti Murthy, who is Associate Professor at uh, Kidwai Memorial Hospital in the Department of Hernic Surgery. And she'll be speaking on approach to parotid neoplasms. Uh, thanks, uh, uh, Dr. Azim, and I'd like to first congratulate you guys for have, you know, put together such a good program. I think for most of the PGs, especially MCH students all across the country, I think they're really, you know, uh, very extremely happy with this. And um, let me start with the pre-session uh, talk today, uh, which is on approach to parotid uh, neoplasm. When we talk about parotid neoplasm, it uh, ranges, uh, uh, there's a huge spectrum of it, starting from benign tumors to unacceptable tumors to malignant tumors, those with uh, different metastasis. But because it's just a 15 minute talk, I'll be focusing more on the diagnosis and the treatment between the benign and malignant uh, neoplasms of the uh, parotid. Uh, the di basically the diagnosis of a parotid neoplasm is based on three factors: clinical examination, history, tissue diagnosis, and imaging. So, in history, uh, we uh, age and gender. I'll explain about it later. But uh, history of uh, skin lesions, history of uh, lesions elsewhere in the head and neck, history of lymphadenopathy elsewhere in the body, or any history of malignancies in the past, all help us in uh, you know, uh, differentiating a primary parotid neoplasm from a, a neoplasm that has metastatized to the uh, parotid. Uh, as, as far as clinical examination is concerned, uh, concerned a rapid uh, uh, growing mass that is fixed, which is painful with the facial nerve paralysis, uh, with skin involvement and nodal metastasis, all of them usually are a red flag uh, uh, signs of a parotid malignancy. Uh, as I told you before, age and gender plays a huge role, especially in uh, uh, you know, guiding us towards the right uh, pathology of the parotid neoplasm. As you can see, uh, various, uh, be it benign or uh, malignant, most of these tumors have a, a gender and a, a age predilection. Uh, this this table actually does not, even my presentation does not cover on the pediatric uh, uh, malignancies, but even in uh, adults, uh, the one of the commonest um, malignant neoplasm is mucopidermo carcinoma followed by uh, adenoid cystic uh, carcinoma. And when we uh, look at the next stage of uh, you know evaluating a patient with parotid neoplasm, uh, fine needle aspiration cytology is almost always one of the first investigation that we order. It is very safe and cost effective with almost no complications and does not require any local anesthesia. I haven't mentioned, but uh, it has a very high sensitivity and a specific specificity rate in differentiating a parotid swelling from uh, a neoplasm and uh, differentiating a neoplasm from an inflammatory swelling of the parotid. Uh, however, it has a very high rate of uh, intermediate findings or for the FNAC to be non-diagnostic. This is especially true when there is you know, surrounding inflammation around the uh, lesion and also when the lesion is cystic. The uh, exact area of uh, uh, the aspiration is extremely important in coming to the right diagnosis. Hence, uh, with cytology, the accuracy of pinpointing the tumor type and also the grade is a bit low. And uh, it, this also uh, is extremely uh, dependent on the cytologist who uh, does the procedure. And also if it is done on a, by a radiologist, uh, if it is under ultrasound guided, so there is even more uh, discrepancy between uh, the performer and the observer. Uh, as per the ASCO guidelines, currently today, Milan uh, system of uh, reporting salivary gland cytopathology is the current standard. Almost most of the tertiary centers do report their cytology using uh, Milan system. The risk of malignancy uh, with this system has been uh, studied uh, again and again, but a recent uh, meta-analysis and systematic review has studied the risk of uh, uh, malignancy both for uh, overall uh, tumors and also specifically for high-grade tumors. And they have uh, shown that uh, uh, Milan system of uh, reporting has uh, shown uh, good, uh, good uh, uh, rates uh, uh, correlation with the final histopathology. 
However, we do require core biopsy very often. Uh, this is mainly because in a core biopsy, we have a preserved uh, histological architecture, and hence it gives a better uh, tumor uh, grading. It also gives a better uh, tumor typing also. The rate of uh, indeterminate and inadequate specimen in a core biopsy is extremely low. However, this uh, core biopsy is associated with a uh, few cases of uh, complications like hematoma or even temporary uh, facial nerve paralysis. Uh, a recent meta-analysis uh, who has studied, uh, uh, which has include, I think it's around uh, uh, 90, uh, I think 72 uh, studies which have compared the core biopsy and FNAC in diagnosing a malignant uh, uh, salivary gland neoplasms and the core biopsy has fared very well with a very high sensitivity and a specificity rate. Even when you look at the ROC curve, we can look at the uh, uh, higher diagnostic performance of a uh, core needle uh, biopsy. Most often we will be able to make a tissue di uh, tumor diagnosis with either an FNAC or a core biopsy, but we will get in very rarely we do get into trouble, especially when there is dual cytological features like uh, mucoepidermoid, where there are mucoid features and epidermal cells. So in these cases, core biopsy is extremely helpful and very rarely molecular testing is used, but uh, uh, use of molecular testing and uh, identification of these gene uh, rearrangements and fusion is not routinely done in the clinical practice, but it is good to know because few of these uh, uh, gene rearrangements and fusions are also a way for targeted therapy. Uh, imaging is almost always always required and ultrasound is one of the first one that we go to because most of the parotid neoplasms involve the superficial lobe of the parotid. However, ultrasound is uh, very operator dependent and the ramus of the mandible almost always obsc obscures evaluating deep lobe of the parotid. So very often we need a cross-sectional imaging with uh, a CT scan or an MRI to understand the extent of the disease and its involvement of the surrounding uh, structures. Uh, whether there is parapharyngeal uh, involvement, whether in, in, cases, in all cases of recurrent tumor, we do need a cross-sectional imaging. When there is a, a science of malignancy, we always require a cross-sectional imaging. And we also need it as, to document change in growth, especially in cases where we are waiting and watching in some of the benign neoplasm. MRI especially helps us to categorize the salivary gland uh, uh, tumor, like how cytology and core biopsy helps. Even features of MRI helps us to type the tumor. And a diffusion weighted imaging also gives us a further additional information regarding the tissue architecture. Uh, MRI also has an upper hand uh, in cases with suspected case of perineural invasion and intracranial extension in parotid tumors. However, CT scan, as we all know, has a better ability to evaluate uh, bone erosion, and uh, especially in masses when we suspect is involving the temporal uh, bone or skull base through the paraphyngeal space or the mandible anteriorly, we do require a CT scan. Uh, both benign and malignant uh, tumors have their own specific MRI signature, which is based on their intensity on T1, on T2, the ADC values, and also time type of time to intensity curve. That is how rapid uh, a tumor uh, takes up the contrast is, uh, is, is basically dependent on four uh, types. Type A is where the contrast is not taken up very fast. However, a malignant tumor, which is extremely vascular, almost always takes up the contrast very fast. And this is considered as B or C. So as you can see, most of the malignant tumors, they do have a, a B or a C uh, type of uh, uh, you know, time to intensity curve. We must remember that uh, although uh, you know, it's so many features of uh, MRI do help us in understanding the tumor pathology, MRI uh, features does not, uh, is not a substitute for uh, pathological evaluation. So we cannot base our diagnosis completely on these MRI features, but it should always be in combination with either the cytology or the core biopsy features. This is an uh, T1 weighted uh, MRI uh, image uh, uh, showing the parotid region where you, can, where you can see that the yellow line involves the parotid space. The red line uh, is the masticatory, is the ma masticatory space. The purple line is the parapharyngeal space. And the red dot is our uh, external uh, carotid artery. And the, 
green space is the carotid space and this is our uh, retromandibular vein. We should remember that we might not be able to see the facial nerve outright, uh, outrightly in a MRI or either in a CT scan. And because the uh, nerve lies exactly uh, 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 by, this, uh, by the side of the retromandibular vein, we take retromandibular vein as a landmark for a facial nerve in the uh, imaging. And uh, when we talk about imaging, uh, especially if we are suspecting a malignant uh, uh, neoplasm, then we'll have to rule out distant metastasis as 5.5% of them do present with distant metastasis, most commonly to lung. Adenocarcinoma and adenocystic carcinoma are one of the commonest tumors that uh, metastatize. And hence, when we see these tumors and a high-grade high tumor and a advanced stage tumor, which are most often do through a distant metastasis, a CT scan of the chest or a PET CT is extremely important. In the cases where, in cases when uh, the FNS or the core biopsy gives us a diagnosis of something like adenocarcinoma or squamous cell carcinoma, uh, doing a PET CT is even more, FDG PET CT is even more important because even an infraclavicular primary can throw a metastasis to parotid neoplasm. So this should always be borne in mind when we look at diagnosis like squamous cell carcinoma or adenocarcinoma in a parotid. And I've put up this slide basically to show that uh, patients with uh, adenocystic carcinoma, even though they do have a distant metastasis, they do live well with, uh, uh, with uh, uh, reported cases of up to 10 years with metastasis has been uh, uh, reported. So hence, when we look at a, a case with adenocystic carcinoma who already has a distant metastasis at presentation, we should subject the patient uh, for a local treatment because local regional control uh, of the disease is paramount in a case of adenocystic disease. So to summarize the diagnosis uh, section of the presentation, we require history, clinical e evaluation, tissue evaluation, and imaging, and all three are go is going to guide us in diagnosing a, a, a parotid neoplasm, whether it is benign or malignant, and if malignant, the type of tumor, we do require all three uh, parameters. Before going into the treatment of uh, parotid neoplasm, uh, I'm sure all of you have seen this table across all the uh, most of the papers where we the grade of the tumor is extremely important. So it is important we know the commonly occurring uh, um, malignant lesions of the parotid and to which grade they belong to because this plays a huge role in planning our further treatment. Along with the grade, we have a stage of the parotid uh, malignancy, which also helps us further in managing the uh, patient. For almost all uh, pathologies, except uh, probably, uh, except, uh, you know, metastatic uh, lesions to parotid is not something that I'm going to talk to about. But uh, whether it is a benign, especially the pleomorphic adenoma, which uh, comprises about 85% of the parotid, benign parotid neoplasm, the main uh, uh, treatment modality is the surgery. And when it comes to malignant parotid neoplasms, also surgery stands the, uh, as the uh, primordial uh, management strategy. So when we talk about uh, surgery, we I'm sure all of you have heard uh, different uh, variations in the terminology. Partial parotidectomy or adequate parotidectomy uh, uh, is uh, where we excise the tumor with just a cuff of normal uh, parotid parenchyma is called a partial or an uh, adequate parotidectomy. A superficial parotidectomy is called so when we remove all the parenchyma of the superficial uh, lobe that is superficial to the facial nerve. Total parotidectomy is when we also uh, remove the deep lobe of the parotid but the facial nerve is intact. And we call it radical when we also sacrifice the facial nerve. And we call it extended radical when the surrounding structures are also removed along with the uh, facial nerve. It is, uh, we should remember that the extent of parotidectomy is just not based on uh, one thing. The decision making and the extent of the parotidectomy is basically based on three factors. That is presence of intraparotid lymph nodes, facial nerve involvement and how the facial nerve is, and also the margin that we require to clear the tumor completely. We should always remember that the division that we have for superficial and deep lobe is iatrogenic. It's not embryonical. So removing uh, superficial parotid does not mean that the 
tumor has not crossed to the deeper compartment. And we should always look at parotid as a lymphatic basin and not just as a, uh, you know, as two separate entity as superficial and deep lobe. Uh, most often, uh, the discrepancy arises in T1, T2 uh, superficial parotid tumors, uh, parotid malignancies, whether to do a superficial parotidectomy or less than superficial parotidectomy, or do we do a total parotidectomy? Proponents of uh, superficial or less than superficial uh, parotidectomy are those who say that, you know, with a low grade tumor, with a small tumor, we can achieve a good uh, local control. And, uh, and, and, you know, uh, these are the uh, studies who have always said that the incidence of either partial and permanent uh, facial nerve palsy can be as high as 35%. But we all know in clinical scenario, that is not true. The, uh, the various other studies who are against this philosophy uh, do advocate total parotidectomy in all cases. This is mainly because they uh, look at parotid has a <clears throat> lymph nodal uh, basin and uh, with the parotid has approximately 26 uh, lymph nodes within it. So intraparotid lymph node is something that is going to uh, affect the outcome of the patient and hence a lot of them do advocate total parotidectomy even in an early tumor. Not just the size or the uh, you know, T stage of the tumor, the tumor grade and location also does affect our uh, decision. Uh, so it is almost all, almost preferable to do a total parotidectomy in a malignant cases. However, in a benign case, you we can get away with just a, a limited parotidectomy or adequate or a less than superficial parotidectomy. In cases like pleomorphic adenoma, just an adequate parotidectomy with a cuff of normal parotid tissue is more than enough. The uh, intraparotid uh, presence of uh, intraparotid node has a huge prognostic uh, implication because uh, intraparotid node in a malignant parotid uh, tumor is almost, uh, the incidence of this is almost up to 7.6 to 73.3%. And these patients also have a two to three fold higher risk of recurrence and also two fold uh, higher risk of death. And hence, it is extremely important to clear all the intraparotid nodes. And we should all, always remember that the watershed line, as we, uh, which is facial nerve, for you know, anatomical dissection of a superficial and deep lobe, this uh, watershed line crosses through retromandibular vein for lymph nodes. So the tissue that is between the facial nerve and the retromandibular vein which is considered as uh, deep lobe conventionally also has a high number of parotid nodes. So hence it is almost safer to do a total parotidectomy even in an early disease to get a better control. In a higher stage disease in T3, T4 parotid tumors, obviously there is no, <clears throat> there is no uh, controversy here. Uh, total parotidectomy is almost always required. Beyond this, either a radical or an extended radical uh, parotidectomy is advocated depending on the extent of the disease. The next controversial uh, uh, subject in uh, parotid neoplasm is uh, how to manage a <clears throat> N0 neck. We should remember that uh, the risk of uh, upper nodal metastasis, like all other uh, head and neck uh, cancer tumors, it hold, the same uh, principle holds good here. So when the risk of uh, occult nodal metastasis is low in a low-grade tumor or in a young patient, when the lesion is very small, we can advocate a wait and see policy. Uh, however, we for various studies have shown a varying uh, rate of uh, occult nodal metastasis in uh, primary tumors of the uh, parotid. And hence, when uh, these risk, fact uh, risk factors are discovered, especially preoperatively, like a high-grade or a high-stage tumor, elective, uh, <clears throat> an elective neck dissection is advocated from level 1 to 4. And uh, neck, elective neck irradiation can be considered uh, in uh, cases when we find out that the tumor uh, grade is higher or the stage is higher postoperatively. Anyways, these patients are subjected to adjuvant radiation and at that time an elective irradiation can be uh, planned. There is no doubt that uh, patients with uh, uh, you know, positive nodal disease need a comprehensive neck dissection from level 1 to level 5. The study from uh, uh, Ali et al. has been very pivotal in this because they have shown that uh, uh, level 1 and level 5 metastasis is usually less than 7% 
when in cases of N0, uh, clinically N0, but that rate increases to up almost 35% when the uh, uh, when there is a nodal metastasis that is evident preoperatively, and hence in an elective uh, in an elective neck dissection we do uh, uh, clear levels only from level one to four, and in a comprehensive neck dissection for a parotid malignancy we clear from level one to five. The next uh, controversial thing is the management of facial nerve. Here uh, patients who have uh, confirmed malignancy and a non-functional facial nerve at the time of surgery. Uh, sacrificing the facial nerve is quite straightforward <clears throat> uh, and uh, however sacrificing a facial nerve when the facial nerve is normal clinically has a huge implication. We should always remember that uh, sacrificing the facial nerve just to get a, pos a negative margin is not going to help us because uh, um, it did not, uh, sacrificing the facial nerve to just get a clear margin did not uh, was uh, was uh, uh, you know, it did not avoid getting a positive margin and also that the local recurrence rate is equivalent when both preserve, when we preserve the facial nerve and when we sacrifice. So, uh, when, when we can remove the tumor of the facial nerve, it is extremely important to preserve the facial nerve, especially when it is functional. And we might require frozen section in cases when we do decide to remove uh, or reset the facial nerve. This is because we have, uh, even in cases of inflammation, the lesion might be adherent to the facial nerve. So before sacrificing the facial nerve, we have to be as sure as possible that the lesion or the neoplasm that we're dealing with is malignant and, uh, and the tissue surrounding the facial nerve has to be subjected to intraoperative frozen section. This is one of the studies that I found. Uh, I have presented this only because I want to show you the discrepancy that we have between the FNAC the frozen section and the final histopathology that we get. You can very well see that, you know, most often the FNAC has been indeterminate or it's just been very suspicious. But however, the final histopathology has shown to be malignant and it can happen vice versa where, you know, we've had cases of, the, the study had cases of uh, mucabidermoid carcinoma, which was suggestive of Warthins on FNAC. So it is extremely important that you get a frozen section of the tissue around the facial nerve before sacrificing. The next, uh, uh, once the surgery and the neck, once the parotidectomy and the neck dissection is done, when the patient have adverse features like uh, intermediate and high grade, close or positive margins, uh, perineural invasion, lymph nodal metastasis, T3, T4, A tumors have to be subjected for adjuvant radiation and and or chemotherapy. This is a recent uh, NCDB analysis that was uh, done, which has shown the uh, efficacy of adding adjuvant radiotherapy for patients both in early stage and late stage disease who have these adverse. And uh, this study has also shown the benefit of we normally do not advocate chemotherapy along with radiation therapy uh, in uh, parotid malignancies. But uh, this study, uh, this NCDB uh, analysis has shown that addition of chemotherapy uh, along with radiotherapy, especially in uh, later stage of the disease, uh, did not show any improved uh, outcomes. And this question will be answered uh, when we do get uh, the results of the randomized uh, phase two trial uh, uh, that is uh, being done by RTOG, which will be completed in October uh, 2028, which is looking at the uh, efficacy of adding chemotherapy adjoint to uh, radiation in uh, cases of uh, malignant uh, salivary gland tumor. Uh, to conclude, uh, uh, the over five-year overall survival rate is quite good for parotid neoplasm. It's approximately around 75. But to achieve this, we should uh, have uh, a good uh, pre-surgery uh, or a pre-management uh, tissue diagnosis. And uh, although various controversies do exist regarding extent of uh, parotidectomy, uh, we should always remember that a lesser invasive surgery must not be performed because of lack of skill. And uh, extent of parotidectomy, as I described before, uh, should be based on uh, uh, the grade of the tumor, the stage of the uh, tumor, and must al almost always be oncologically sound. And in tumors who have a high risk of uh, occult nodal metastasis, an elective neck treatment must be considered. Uh, parotid neoplasm has way more uh, uh, topics to be covered, which I didn't do because of you know time constraints. And uh, I'd like to conclude my talk and 
Thanks for the patient. Thank you, Dr. Sanskriti, for such an uh, excellent and exhaustive talk. Now we'll move on to our next uh, session, which is the case presentation. Uh, for that, I would like to invite Dr. Anuja Deshmukh, Madam, who's consultant, uh, Professor Head Neck Surgery at Tata Memorial Hospital, Mumbai. Then uh, Dr. Uh, Vidya Dharan Shiva Kumar, who is Director and Consultant Head Neck Surgery, Thank Hospital, Chennai. Dr. Swagnik Chakrabarti, Consultant Head Neck Surgery, Chandan Hospital, Lucknow. And uh, Dr. Ankit Mahuwakar, who is Consultant Head Neck Surgery, HCG Cancer Center, Mumbai. And uh, the case will be presented by Dr. Jamni Kaur, who is from RCC Trivandrum. Good evening, everyone. Uh, today, uh, I'll be uh, presenting the case of uh, Mrs. Kamal Amma. Uh, she's a 53-year-old lady. She's a homemaker from Kollam District. And uh, she came to us with the presenting complaints of uh, swelling in front of the left ear uh, since eight months. Uh, she had this swelling uh, since eight months, which was uh, inside us and onset, and uh, it gradually progressed to the present size. Uh, it was not associated with pain. Uh, there was no history suggested, suggestive of uh, facial nerve palsy. Uh, there was no asymmetry of the face or difficulty in closure of the eyes. There was no difficulty in chewing food, or there was no difficult. Uh, there was no drooling of saliva from the angle of mouth. Uh, there was no history of any other swellings in the neck. Uh, no history of cough, uh, hemoptysis, night sweats, or moving on to the past illness. Uh, she is a diabetic on oral uh, hypoglycemic agents and hypertensive on uh, oral uh, antihypertensives. She had history of uh, COVID infection in November 2021, but she was managed in home quarantine. Uh, she also gave history of uh, uh, surgery in the left parotid region 20 years back, but there were no details available. On uh, further probing, uh, she said that she was told that it was not cancerous. Uh, there was uh, there's no history of bronchial asthma, tuberculosis or any systemic disease, uh, no history of any uh, previous radiation exposure and no history of uh, drug alert. She consumes a mixed diet, uh, no adverse habits, no change in bowel or bladder habits. Uh, no significant weight change. Uh, she has normal appetite. And uh, in history, there's nothing significant. And summarizing my history of 53 year old uh, lady, diabetic and hypertensive, uh, with a painless swelling in the left parotid region uh, since eight months and uh, no symptoms of facial palsy. Let's go to your first slide. So, you said this patient had a history of similar swelling 20 years back, and now you're giving a history eight months back. So can you just elaborate on the duration of this uh, swelling? Because it is very important in a parotid case that the swelling history is very important. How much time duration the swelling has started increasing? Uh, Ma'am, this present swelling uh, she's had since the last eight months. She did give history that she got operated uh, 20 years back uh, for a swelling in the same region. Uh, in and after the surgery, she was asymptomatic. She was apparently normal. And since the last eight months, she's had the swelling, which has been gradually progressive, and now it has come to the present size. Came to us. So, can you go back to your that twenty years history? Go back to that slide. So, so there were no details about that twenty years back. What HPR came and nothing was. Uh, Ma'am, the patient uh, is uh, she doesn't have any details, but on further probing, she said that. Uh, as per the doctors who were treating her, uh, it was non malignant. It was not cancerous. That so, this swelling started appearing only last eight months. Yes, ma'am. The present swelling was since only late, last eight months. In between the interval from the last surgery to the uh, present swelling, uh, she was asymptomatic. Go back to your second slide now. First thing you wanted to rule out, there is no pain for this swelling. Anything else you want to rule out before you talk about facial nerve palsy in your skin life? Whenever you take a negative history, any other things before you comment on the facial nerve palsy? Or you want to rule out? Uh, Ma'am, there was no history of trauma to the uh, trauma to that area. There is no Important history. Important thing in here will come as a history of surgery. That is the most relevant surgery, uh, a positive finding for this patient. And the second, then will come the negative history. So, negative history apart from the pain, you will ask for the patient who was in the swelling in the ear. Pain, fever, fever discharge. Uh, ma'am, no history of uh, any uh, fever or uh, ear discharge, ma'am. Is she not given any history? So any you will rule out everything about uh, inflammatory diseases or infective pathology first. Okay. 
because she has been treated already. Anything, Ankit, you want to ask? Uh, yes, madam. Actually, I just wanted to point out the same thing. What Anuja madam said is that whenever we are dealing with any pathology related to a gland, especially one which is secretory and has a duct, you have to realize we need to rule out infective, inflammatory, uh, systemic metastasis, and as well as tumor. But the most important thing also is the obstruction in the duct. So what madam said is that your negative history should also include that whether there is any uh, waxing, veining in the size of the swelling with salivation, or uh, anything related to the opposite parotid gland, whether the patient is having any issues there. As well as that, in the next slide, when you have mentioned, can you just switch over to the third slide, please? So in this case, your history of past illness, you have written down there is no history of previous radiation exposure. Yes, sir. Can you elaborate there? What is the uh, uh, importance of writing that? Uh, parotid tumors uh, have been... Uh... Uh, given uh, with the uh, some parotid tumors are known to be uh, caused due to radiation exposure sir for example uh, wadden's tumor or uh, salivary duct carcinoma so i just wanted to rule out that Good. dr ne dr neha this is dr vidyadharan uh, this is uh, not pertaining to the case but for academic general questions uh, do you do you would you ask a history of smoking for any any individual with a parotid swelling or a salivary gland swelling Yes, sir. I mentioned that uh, she did not have any history of, uh, she did not have any adverse habit history, but uh, smoking history associated with the uh, Wadden's tumor, sir. Yeah, that's correct. And the second question would be surgery to the uh, parotid region. Uh, the, the, any further details? Would you ask anything to do with skin? In certain cases, general academic, not for this particular patient. Whether this uh, skin was... Uh... Would, would your line of thought process when you're taking history, if they do give a history of Excise skin lesions. Uh, would yes. you, so, would any cutaneous malignancies? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. They right. are prone for uh, parotid. So, squamous cell or melanoma, etc. Okay. Thanks. You will also ask about the discharging sinus at the parotid region. So, any kind of uh, post surgery syndrome, all this negative history you need to ask. So, discharging sinus, fungus in the operative site, all negative history you have to do it when you are present this case. Uh, I would just like to add one thing uh, just before you continue. Since you have mentioned that there was a history of surgery done on the same side, always keep a track of asking whether immediately post-surgery patient did develop any facial weakness or paresis, which gradually over the period of time has uh, improved. The reason for asking this is that if you are going back into the operative field, you will have to understand that facial already was handled. Probably it will be very much near to the incision site. And such patients would need some adjuvant along uh, in the operation theater to help you out identify the uh, go back to your second slide you said there are no other swelling in the any other swelling in the neck do you want to elaborate on that do you want to tell us something more because see in parotid cases if you are presenting a case if you don't uh, say what you want to then examiner won't ask you any question so you have to lead the examiner to the question so you had to be more specific. So you should say it like no history of any swelling in the opposite side of the parotid or a submandibular gland or a lacrimal gland. If you say it like that, I know that what you're pointing towards it. Do you want to elaborate? Uh, Ma'am, at this point of time, uh, we have a swelling in the left parotid. So I, uh, keeping the certain differentials in mind, I would like to rule out if there's any lymph nodal swellings or if the um, parotid itself uh, has... Uh, metastasized to the neck so I, I i wanted to rule out that so did you get point i have made Do yes ma'am tell something about that also uh, ma'am the involvement of the opposite side gland uh, opposite side parotid gland yeah submandibular gland if suppose a patient comes with the parotid swelling along with the submandibular gland swelling and a lacrimal gland also swelling and maybe a bilateral presentation what is your differential diagnosis um, Jogren's, uh, yeah. So in Jogren syndrome, you will have a generalized salivary gland uh, enlargement and this is kind of autoimmune disease and uh, any malignancy you, you, you Lymph know which can... Lymphomas, uh, they can come with bilateral swellings. Or, yeah. so uh, NHL lymphoma, uh, there is a 14% up to chances of having NHL lymphoma. So Jogren syndrome is an autoimmune disease, so you have to treat it, but at the same time, you have to rule out that it is not a lymphoma, okay? 
Yes, so sir. you have to give a history and your clinical examination, you have to give a negative history for that. So please add to your list yes, of sir. negative history. Any more question? Anybody? Ankit, uh, Vidya Dharan? No, ma'am. I think we should continue. But, but I'm not happy with your negative history and the way you have presented. It needs to be more focused and more uh, kind of... Uh, uh, in a flow. I'm not getting a flow when you are presenting a negative history. Ankit, do you agree with me? Yes, ma'am. She needs to just add few points which you had mentioned. That would make you it okay. You rule out abscess. You need to rule out inflammatory diseases. You need to rule out the generalized systemic diseases. Then history, the kind of uh, diseases elsewhere, which is metastasizing to the parotid. So any in swelling anywhere or any other malignancy rule out all those things that is like metastasizing to or uh, any kind of a swelling in the oral cavity also that also comes as a negative history any parapharyngeal mass or any extension of the parotid tumor into the oropharynx that also comes as a negative history and then then comes the complication then i will ask the facial no palsy and other things will come into the picture. The skin over it, the sinuses, the phrase syndrome. He had a detail about the surgery, things. Everything needs to be spoken about before we complete our clinical exam. Mouth opening also, I think, needs to be added. So what uh, Dr. Neha, what Dr. Anuja is saying is basically if you leave the examiner to whatever you know, then you know you spend a lot of time in answering the right questions during the exam. And uh, with that, the negative history comes. If you mention, like, for example, like Madam was saying, skin lesions and skin things, then you they would ask you some questions regarding ACC or melanoma. And so the negative history helps in uh, getting to know your knowledge all around and then coming to the final diagnosis so that you spend a lot of time in the history and the uh, whole uh, examination. Uh, yes, so yes. when Madam did mention that about the oropharynx, I thought that one of the reasons they have difficulty in swallowing, do you know why? If there's a parotid lesion with difficulty in swallowing. Uh, sir, if there is uh, involvement of the deep lobe or extension into the parapharyngeal space, then uh, they'll have dysphagia. Yeah, so that, that deep lobe could also cause the lower pharyngeal nerves, the glossopharyngeal compression uh, also. No? So yes, that may be the reason also. Okay. You can have a voice change also. There will be many other, even the masseter involvement because of the infiltrating tumor from outside. The patient will have a problem related with the opening the mouth and other things also will be there. So you need to ask all this uh, negative history and that will come into your, uh, like how you present your onset duration and a progression of a spend. I think you go ahead, right? We all uh, moving on to the uh, examination. On uh, general examination, the uh, patient is conscious oriented. She had a performance status of BCOG 0. She is moderately built and nourished uh, with a BMI of uh, 24.7. Uh, there is no pallor, icterus, clubbing, sinosis, uh, generalized lymphadenopathy, or pedal edema. Uh, vitals uh, were stable. Her blood pressure was 130 by 80, right arm supine. Pulse was normal and uh, respiratory rate. Moving on to the uh, local examination. Uh, on inspection of the face, uh, there was a 3 centimeter linear vertical scar mark in front of the tragus and a swelling in the left preauricular uh, area approximately 5 into 4 centimeters and uh, the skin over the swelling was stretched. Uh, there was no facial asymmetry and the jaw movements were normal and uh, oral cavity oropharynx uh, inspection. Again, here yeah, just to disturb you in between, before you go to facial symmetry, you have to finish with the skin. No discharging sinuses, there is no obvious uh, neck nodes. Those things need to come up, then you have to present that there is no facial asymmetry. So on uh, oral cavity, oropharyngeal examination, her parotid or torifice was visualized in normal position. There was no bulge in the oropharynx or deviation of the uvula. Uh, on examination of the neck, there were no uh, visible swellings or pulsation or dilated vessels, scar, sinuses or fistulae. And uh, there was no facial asymmetry and her uh, jaw movements were uh, normal. If you present and if you say inter distance in a centimeter also, that also adds to it. Even whenever you are presenting a oral cavity cases, it will add to your uh, positive examination time. So just writing only jaw movements are normal, you can write inter distance is this much. 
on opening the so as we can see there was a vertical linear scar mark approximately 3 cm in front of the pages and around uh, 5 into 4 uh, cm uh, swelling in front of the in the preauricular area uh, the skin over the swelling uh, was stretched and there is no sinus or uh, dilated uh, vessels noted in the neck or uh, swelling noted in the neck uh, no facial asymmetry uh, moving on to the palpation uh, there was a single uh, 5 cross 4 cm non tender uh, swelling with no local rise of temperature it is firm lobulated uh it's in the left preauricular area in front of the tragus uh, the mobility of the swelling is uh, restricted and uh, the skin of the swelling uh, was tethered uh, the limits of the swelling superiorly up to the zygoma inferiorly up to the angle of mandible posteriorly 2 uh, cm anterior from the mastoid tip and uh, anteriorly uh, it's around 6 cm from the uh, left on palpation of the neck uh, no significant neck nodes and uh, oral cavity uh, oropharynx examination also there was uh, no significant uh, bulge or uh, 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 pulse noted in the oropharynx the opposite side gland was normal and uh, uh, there was no uh, swelling noted over the eye or the scalp uh, her facial of examination was uh, normal uh, nose and paranasal sinuses also were uh, normal on doing a video laryngoscopy uh, of the larynx both the vocal cords were mobile the glottic space was adequate and her lower cranial nerves uh, were within normal limits there were no neurological deficits noted what are the lower cranial nerves you examined uh, ma'am 9th 10th uh, 11th and 12th cranial nerve so how do you examine the 9th one Uh, ma'am the we check for the gag reflex uh, by using a cotton uh, application over the palate uh, area and if the patient is having uh, coughing uh, then the gag reflex is present uh, for the 10th cranial nerve uh, also uh, the the evident for the ga gag reflex is the 10th cranial nerve so and also her voice was normal so vocal cords were mobile so 10th cranial nerve was normal uh there was no uh, the both the her tongue movements were normal so the hypoglossal was normal and uh, there was no uh, palatal movement also palatal movement also ma'am uh, for the ninth uh, cranial nerve and uh, uh, her shoulder movements were normal so the nerve to the trapezius also uh, was not the 11th spinal accessory also was not have you examined the entire uh, lymphatic basin which drains into the parotid sir i uh, examine uh, all the neck nodes and the uh, parotid area is mean the ground uh, okay. yes, the skin and the scalp uh, and the temple area uh, there were no swellings or uh, she did not have any discharge from the external auditory canal no sir the ear examination was normal do you want to uh, can you just go back to the one of the lateral photographs you have present yeah so anything about the scar you said it is the scar in front of the preauricular area so is this the usual scar what we give uh, ma'am uh, this is uh, the scar usually what is given for if, to, for draining a parotid abscess inflammatory lesion of the parotid but not for a parotid swelling uh, sorry uh, for a uh, parotid ectomy it, it, it's like uh, i can say the vertical scar in front of the preauricular area it is away from the pinna almost a centimeter or a 1.5 cm that's what i can say yes ma'am it's not in the crease which is the usual crease yes, when we give the if you give that information more it will be a added advantage you are actually describing the scar of for this patient and the extent of the scar in a vertical direction so it is from the helix till the down or uh, till the angle of the mandible the short of angle of the mandible that will be the vertical extent of the scar so you need to add those two factors when you actually present this case uh, her systemic examination uh, was normal uh, there was no, uh, nothing significant so on uh, summarizing my history in examination of 53 year old uh, lady who is a diabetic hypertensive uh, with a painless swelling in the left parotid area since 8 months and no symptoms of facial palsy uh, with a 504 uh, cm non tender uh, firm lobulated swelling in the left preauricular region in front of the tragus with restricted mobility and tethering of the overlying skin uh, with normal oral cavity examination and no features of facial okay. the underlying structure the whether it is fixed to the underlying structure with the massive pain and all that 
Ma'am, the swelling had a restricted mobility uh, in all the places. Ma'am, <clears throat> what is your uh, differential diagnosis regarding this swelling? Uh, sir, after the uh, histone examination, my uh, differential diagnosis will be uh, a neoplasm of the left parotid, uh, possibly malignant neoplasm. And uh, other differential diagnosis uh, would include a lymph nodal swelling uh, or a lymphomatous swelling, but unlikely as the swelling is firm and anything else? Uh, metastasis to the uh, parotid. Anything related to some non parotid pathology? Any other structure that can give rise to a swelling in the parotid region that can mimic a parotid tumor? Uh, so, brinkial cyst, uh, first brinkial cleft cyst can present in the uh, parotid area and lymph node. Okay, anything else? Vascular anomaly? Uh, AV malformation uh, like a hemangioma, sir. Some nerve tumor? Uh, schwannomas. Okay. Uh, the, uh, now, you mentioned one point that uh, prefer preferably it's a malignant neoplasm. So yes. What are your points in favor of it being a malignant neoplasm? Uh, so, one is the history. Uh, she's giving eight months history of the swelling and uh, progression in that duration. And also the fixity of the uh, lesion and uh, the teethering of the overlying skin. She has a history of previous surgery 20 years back. Yes, sir. Right. Now, if I think it this way, it was a it was a benign tumor, most likely. And uh, and the, as per the incision, as Anuja Madam and pointed it out, the swelling, the surgical scar doesn't look to be a, a classic surgical scar for a parallelectomy. Yes, sir. So maybe, maybe some uh, nodulectomy sort of a surgery could have been done. And that has resulted in uh, local or whatever is in some local recurrence of the of a benign parotid swelling, and because of the previous surgery, there there is tethering of the skin overlying that area. Is it not a possible option? Yes, sir. Okay. So, what are the other points that can that can uh, go towards malignancy in this patient? Uh, sir, if the patient had history of. Uh pain and uh, involvement of the facial nerve, uh, that points towards uh, malignant neurology. It's not there in the patient. Next. Lymph uh, nodes? Lymph nodal lymph involvement. Uh, no lymph nodal involvement. Again. Uh, so, uh, before I think, uh, uh, we comment on whether it's a malignant or a malignant. Or, I mean, ra rather better to say it, it, it's a... Uh, parotid, uh, probably a parotid tumor for further investigation. Yes. So with one point, uh, uh, Neha, if uh, what is the reason for pain in a malignant tumor? Why uh, do you so think the patient? Uh, if there is a perineal invasion uh, of the underlying nerve, sir. Okay, that's the most common reason for pain. Yes. Okay. Did you inquire about any? Uh, uh, senses, sensory loss or any hyperesthesia over the lobe? Uh, no, sir. There was no history. Uh, I didn't mention it, but there was no history of any... Uh, so that is another point. In a previous surgery, that is another point that has to be taken. Yes. Right. Do you rule out a distant myth in your clinical history? I, I just realized that it is a recent onset. So it's like the surgery has been done previously and now eight months after a long, long time as something has come up and the patient has come to you. So do you want to rule out a distant history? Ma'am, in the history, uh, she did not give any history of cough or hemoptysis or uh, weight loss. Yeah, so bony pain. This negative history is very important, especially when the patient had a benign lesion and now with the swelling, which has kept the skin tethering and fixed it with the underlying structure. So, this is the so That will be the another progression. Yes, ma'am.
Any question, Ankit or Vidya Dharan, you want to ask anything to the uh, Nothing at present, ma'am. Same to ma'am. Let's continue. Anything more you want to tell us? We are done with your... Uh, how you want to work with, work up this patient? Um, uh, I would like to uh, do imaging uh, for this patient. Uh, starting with an ultrasound of the parotid area. One sec, one sec. Just before we go ahead with the workup, so can you just summarize for everybody what is the summary? Um, I'm a 53 year old uh, lady with who is a diabetic and hypertensive uh, with a painless swelling in the left parotid area since eight months and uh, no symptoms of facial palsy. Uh, on examination, having a four into uh, five centimeter. thing you're missing in this one, two lines, first two lines. Uh, with a history of uh, surgery in the left parotid area. Yes, so that's the most important thing you have to tell us in the summary. If you don't tell us, it's interesting because we don't know that we are going to do in, go in a redo kind of a surgery. And we are, so there are lots of things we have to anticipate when we do this. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, clinical examination. Uh, on clinical examination, she's having a, a 5 into 4 centimeter non tender uh, firm lobulated swelling in the left preauricular area. In front of the tragus with the restricted mobility and tethering of the overlying skin uh, with normal oral cavity examination and no features of uh, facial nerve weakness. Oral cavity ends where? And where Up to the anterior uh, tonsil or pillar. So, oral cavity oropharyngeal examination. Yeah, so oropharyngeal examination and oral cavity. Okay. So, if you say only oral cavity is only limited with the RMT, that's it. Right. So you can tell me specifically. So there is no extension. That's what you are telling me about. Right. So now you tell us how you'll work up this patient. First, I would like to uh, take an ultrasound of the parotid uh, to know the leash, uh, whether it is an intragranular or a lymph node swelling, and if there is any suspicion of uh, malignancy. And uh, with that, I would like to take a uh, ultrasound guided FNAC from the uh, lesions. And uh, I would also like to get an uh, MRI of the face and the uh, neck area uh, to see for the uh, extent of the lesion, any deep lobe involvement. I, I partially agree with your first comment. So you said ultrasonography to know whether it is a lymph node or it is a parotid swelling. The location of the parotid swelling for this patient, it is not like a, a, a lymph node, which is a level 2 lymph node, which is like uh, you want to differentiate from the parotid swelling. It is in the parotid area. It can be because of the intraglandular lymph node. This, but you don't want to rule out that. You just want to rule out whether it is in parotid or it is from the level 2. So that sonography will help you, especially when the location of the nodule is at the level 2. I, I In the tail parotid area, this location actually is not a location where you will have this kind of a differential. But I agree that you will take a help of a sonography to take a guided FNSC for this patient. Yes, ma'am. You mentioned about both if, uh, ultrasound and uh, MRI. Yes. So, are you going to go with both the investigations or you are going to uh, decide on one? Uh, sir, I'd like both the investigation. Uh, ultrasound uh, also to take an FNAC and then proceed with an MRI of the face and neck, sir. Now, that swelling is a pretty obvious swelling in the parapet. Yes, sir. Uh, so, uh, usually, uh, how does ultrasound uh, benefit over an MRI in this patient? And why do you want to include ult uh, ultrasound along with MRI for this patient? So for uh, a guided FNAC, sir. Uh, I agree with yeah. you. 
the guided FNC will be a important thing because you can avoid the area which is like a stick or any other. You will get a consistency also. You can go for it. And that's to get a representative tissue, and you can have a on-site kind of a cytology, so you can have a better yield for this. Yes. An another point that I wanted to bring out of you is that uh, it's a recurrent parotid again. So getting a guided guided uh, FNC will always be better as compared to a blind FNC because we don't know about the previous surgery and the scar of the and the scarring that has occurred there. Yes, sir. So I would just like to get one thing clear: ultrasound for all patients, followed by ultrasound guided FNA and then MRI. Why not just get an MRI and get an ultrasound guided FNA? Uh, so ultrasound uh, will be the first investigation because it is cheap also so uh, once we have a tissue uh, diagnosis we can proceed with an mri uh, and if it's a lymphoma uh, then uh, we can proceed with the management for that okay so what extra information can an mri give that i think that's what uh, uh, sir is asking what extra information can an mri uh, sir, mri uh, will tell us where uh, the location of the tumor is also if there's any deep lobe involvement if there's any infiltration of the skull base or uh, perineural invasion or involvement of the facial nerve yeah so and because it's a revision it, it's a recurrent tumor and you're going to do a revision surgery it's better to get all the information so that you can adequately counsel the patient and also prepare yourself for the uh, proper excision or yes, surgical yes. management. Yes, and yes. another advantage of doing an ultrasound, what else can you additionally see when you do an ultrasound guided FNA? Would you be able, keen to see any other thing in that area? Or so would you... vascular malformations can be made out and uh, lymph nodes. Uh, yeah, correct, lymph be... nodes. Because you can get a little bit more information with ultrasound. You said it's cheap, right? Uh, yes, so sir. it's a, I mean, it's easily available um, you can also get a state of lymph nodes level 2A to B. Madam was telling you about. So that's the thing. So just to tell you, just to add a recent thing added up. So people are doing lots of things with the ultrasonography. They are doing tumor also, like how we have come up with the thyroid. But having said that, it is it has got its own limitation and it is operator dependent. So sonography, you can use it. But very judiciously, small lesion, parathyroidosis, tail parotid area, and you can use it to target your uh, area to get a FNAC done. And maybe the MRI will become a gold standard for a bigger lesion and a redo cases. Okay, get to know your anatomy. You get get to know your extent of the tumor, the fixity, the structures, the perineural, everything you know, and you will have it available with you. And uh, which is not the case with the ultrasonography. It will be operator dependent. Yeah, I don't know. In any other investigations? Uh, imaging, in terms of imaging? Uh, sir, in order to rule out uh, bone, uh, bone involvement, we can get a CT scan uh, as an adjunct to the MRI. Okay, more than bone and, involvement. Uh, to rule out uh, any... Uh, it's in uh, meds, we can get a chest, a CT scan of the chest. Okay. So which salivary gland tumor would you have? Would you be looking out for any chest? Uh, sir, adenoid cystic carcinoma and uh, salivary duct carcinomas. Uh, high high propensity. Lung meds. Okay. Uh, just a question. I'm not getting this. So you want to do sonography, you want to do MRI, and if, if you want to see bone, you will do a CT scan. Why do you not see the bone on the MRI? And for a distant meds, one cup, you want to do something else. You want to do a PET scan also. All four or five things, we will do it for this patient. Uh, Ma'am, MRI is more sensitive for uh, seeing any skull base involvement and uh, facial nerve involvement. And uh, uh, CT scan is more uh, sensitive for uh, bony involvement. Oh, uh, up yeah. first MRI. If you have any suspicion, then oh, you can oh, add it to a kind of a, like what we do it for a temporal bone, a fine cuts, skin spines, 
all those that's when you want to see the invasion into the body canal and external artery canal all those things you will see on mri you will first get to know what is the extent and then you will add to it. will you do a pet scan for this patient suppose it is a it's a 8 month uh with a rapid onset swelling the patient was operated in two years back you want to do a pet scan is there any advantage to do a pet scan uh ma'am pet scan uh, uh, can be done to rule out uh, distant mets uh, especially in uh, recurrent tumors or locally advanced uh, tumors and uh, also if there are any uh, cutaneous malignancy then we rule, we want to rule out any parotid uh, mets so in that case pet scan can be taken yeah so i feel pet scan can be used uh, in a parotid salivary gland tumors when you are especially a high grade tumor or you are expecting this patient has got some symptoms and you are feeling that the local extent tells you that this patient this patient you want to rule out distant mets so that you can do a local regional treatment for this patient and if you help you to prognosticate sometimes you can change your clinical decisions also yes ma'am so pet scan is useful and there are few studies which has shown that it is useful but it is not helpful for differentiating many different versus cancer yes so um, to summarize i think uh, anuja madam and vidyadhar and ankit point investigation of choice for a parotid tumor remains contrast enhanced mri uh, in and uh, uh, in and along with the imaging need to get a tissue diagnosis and the tissue diagnosis is either an fnc or a guided fnc for Uh, deep lobe tumors, difficult uh, redo cases, or uh, where we are suspecting that uh, we cannot get a representative tissue with a plain FNC only. And other investigations like CT scan, ultrasound, and uh, PET CT can be done in specific situations, tailored according to the need of the patient. Please go. Uh, what is the sensitivity and specificity of analysis on that please look into your review of literature when present in case for a parotid so that will help you to back up your uh, management protocol whatever you are going to suggest yes one more thing when you will do a core biopsy we we agreed that we will do the fnc for the patient when we will do fnc when we will do core biopsy what kind of a needle you will need the caution you have to have Just a brief, a line about that, just to complete the investigation work. Ah, uh, ma'am, for FNAC, uh, usually a twenty-two gauge needle is preferred, and in case the FNAC is inconclusive, uh, in that case we uh, can proceed with a core needle uh, biopsy. Uh, the difficulty being the core needle biopsy uh, is uh, uh, there are. Uh, Uh, contraindication saying it can cause uh, patient love injury or uh, hematomas uh, but there was a paper uh, by schmidt at all which was a meta analysis and it showed that there was uh, very few chances in which uh, they had hematomas and uh, very few required any intervention so a core needle biopsy can be done when the fnac is inconclusive so in in order to aid in decision making also since we'll get the tissue so we can do that for molecular uh, testing uh, in helping our uh, decision making Oh, oh. Can I ask you what molecular markers would you look for? Can you give uh, me an example of one or two? Uh, so, in case of tumorphic uh, uh, adenomas or uh, carcinoma in tumorphic adenoma, we'll get the PLAG uh, marker. In case of uh, uh, salivary duct carcinoma, we have the HER2 uh, uh, receptors. And in case of uh, uh, adenoid cystic, we'll we'll get the MYB uh, uh, markers. Thank you. Basically, to summarize, 
FNSC and Code Maps. So FNSC is done in a routinely so USD guided. And if you are not getting the diagnostic thing, there is a high suspicion for a malignancy or suspicion for a lymphoma. Yes, you require or if you are thinking not to operate this patient and you wanted a diagnosis for this patient, then you require all tissue for doing a targeted, you want to do some kind of a, a molecular analysis, require more tissue, then you will do a more biopsy. And there are many, SNP was long time back, there are many more meta-analysis that come in 2020. So looking to that, Yes, and for FNNC and core biopsy, both are there. Hello. Hello. Do you want to tell us anything about this case? Any more information you want to give us with the imaging or FNS so that we can proceed? Yes, ma'am. Uh, this patient actually came to us uh, with already worked up. So he had an, uh, she had an MRI, uh, which showed, uh, this is an axial uh, image of a T2-weighted MRI, which showed uh, the lesion was involving the superficial lobe of the parotid. Uh, the plane with the medial pterygoid, uh, sorry, with the plane with the meseta muscle, uh, there was loss of fat plane. And also the skin, uh, there was loss of fat standing uh, in some areas with the skin. It was limited to the superficial lobe. The deep lobe was uh, normal. And uh, she also had uh, an FNAC done outside, uh, which was suggestive of a high-grade salivary gland neoplasm, which was likely malignant. I have mentioned about MRI. Now, can you tell, you mentioned about T2 wet images. Yes. Now, how does this T1 and T2 uh, differentiate, I mean, uh, between uh, uh, type of the tumor you are dealing with? What uh, information is it? Yeah, please. Uh, sir, since parotid tumors are uh, rich in, uh, parotid areas rich in fat, so uh, the normal parotid tissue will be hyperintense on T1. But if it's a highly cellular or a high-grade malignancy, uh, the uh, lesion will uh, have hyper-enhancement in T2. No, no, please, please repeat, please repeat. Uh, so since the parotid is rich in parotid area is rich in fat, normally uh, it will be. Uh, what will be a malignant tumor? Will be uh, hyper intense on T two, sir. So T two is what? T two is water or uh, cellularity? Uh, sorry, sir. High cellularity. Yes, sir. Malignant neoplasm will have high cellularity, right? Yes, sir. Now what? It will be hyper intense on T one or it will hyper intense on T two. T2. T2. Yes. So normally what enhances on T2? Sir, so water and CSF. Water, water and CSF. So yes. more of a fluid content, less of a cellular content will be hyper intense on a T2 image. Yes. Right. So yes, it's a malignancy, it's highly cellular. So cellular component will enhance on a T1 image. Okay, sir. Yeah, please go ahead. So how you will manage this patient? Now you got a MRI done, you got a FNSC done, you have a clinical examination and it has come as a high-grade salivary neoplasm, likely malignant. So anything more you want to do or you are happy with this? Um, Mom, I'd like to uh, discuss the, with the patient regarding the diagnosis and the further treatment planning uh, Okay, what do you want to discuss? Uh, one is the uh, need for surgery. And in this case, uh, a total uh, uh, parotidectomy uh, with the chance of uh, post-operative facial nerve uh, palsy and also the uh, the need of uh, adjuvant uh, radiotherapy in the post-op setting. Now. Okay. And, uh, and also uh, elective neck dissection uh, with the surgery. And uh, reconstruction in case the skin is... Uh, involved in uh, reconstruction with a local or a uh, free flap map. Okay. Do you want to rule out um, it's the distant metastatic workup you want to do? Because since now you are telling me the FNAC is a high-grade salivary neoplasm. 
did you do any work up for the distant mets bare minimum distant metastatic work up or in parotid what else you will do we have already discussed i think but just to come uh, because we have got this fnc now uh, ma'am parotid uh, most commonly metastasizes to the lung so uh, we can get us hrct of the lung uh, of the chest to rule out any distant mets or a, a pet scan to rule out uh, other distant mets yeah so for this patient who has got a 20 years history of surgery and now it has come as a high grade a bare minimum at least will be ncct thorax for this patient to rule out the lung mets but if you get a one investigation if you want to do it a pet scan also is a good investigation to know everything uh, before you this patient is still a localized lesion so uh, just a ct uh, ncct thorax will be good enough also for this patient but if i am deciding and doing a more morbid surgery for a patient then i may think about doing a pet scan so that i get a whole picture that there are not bony metastases there no lung metastases everything i will rule out in one uh, single investigation that way i will get the ct scan to know the mandible involvement everything i will know in one uh, in one investigation that way yes sir right so what kind of a surgery you will do it for this patient the extent of the surgery Um, I might like to do a total parotidectomy, and uh, depending upon the intraoperative uh, involvement of the facial nerve, uh, in case it is involved, uh, also the resection of the involved segment of the facial nerve and the involved skin, uh, followed by uh, reconstruction with a local or a free flap and uh, elective neck dissection of levels uh, two to uh, four, uh, two to four, five, two to five, sorry. what about uh, so so why you want to do a total parotidectomy mam it's a locally advanced uh, uh, tumor if i see uh, how you differentiate that the tumor is not going into the deep lobe what is a landmark on a imaging mam retromandibular vein so what it represents it's the uh, Uh, it rep it uh, represents a fascia venous plane, ma'am, uh, which uh, is arbitrarily dividing the parotid into. What is the MRI? One of the axial MRI, so that we can see that. Slide yeah, yeah, yeah. What information this MRI gives you with the deep lobe? What, what it tells you? Patient had a twenty years back surgery. What information you get? Uh, there might be loss of planes due to the previous surgery and scarring rather i will say that in and around that area there is still lots of parotid tissue superficial to the facial nerve okay so you still have got a tissue so maybe the surgeon has not actually identified the facial nerve and you may have a a good, good plan there to identify the main yeah. trunk what i would say if this nodule would have been sitting next to the retromandibular no vein uh -huh. area then that would have been a more difficult task that that is my interpretation about this okay. very very important point ma'am has brought out because from the incision only we could make out that the uh, surgery was just a excision of a tumor or maybe partial excision also so the planes below are not violated so that is a important point when you talk to the patient take a consent about the surgery you know that you mostly you are dealing with a almost a fresh case where where the facial nerve plane is not much violated and the point um, ma'am was trying to make i think regarding the deep lobe or i think the stylo mandibular tunnel uh, so that is another important point so that is on involved you, yeah so on mri you don't see the facial nerve as such yes, so sir. these are like uh, the the, sign, the 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 structures which point towards the deep lobe and the superficial uh, lobe of the parotid so i was asking the question why not doing a enucleation or extra capsular dissection or a superficial parotidectomy for this patient why you want to do a total parotidectomy for this patient 
मैम ई न्यूक्लिएशन एंड एक्स्ट्रा कैप्सुलर डायसेक्शन इज रेकमेंडेड ओनली फॉर बिनाइन लीजन एंड इन दिस पेशेंट सिंस द स्किन इज इन्वॉल्व सो विल हैव टू एनी वे डू द superficial parotectomy with excision of the skin and it's a locally advanced lesion uh, clinically it is t4a so uh, that uh, requires at least a total parotectomy you did not give me the staging when you presented the case clinically t4a n0 n0 ma'am right anything to the grade grading of the tumor so uh, in the epinacy it was high grade sir so a uh, high grade tumor also uh, total so can you summarize your indications for doing a total parotectomy in this case uh, sir a high grade uh, locally advanced uh, tumor which is either involving the skin or the underlying masseter muscle what you say it's locally advanced instead of that you put on a score it's a t4 that in yes, itself says it's locally so. advanced you don't need to mention whether it is involving skin bone it's a t4 yes. lesion it's a high grade lesion these are the two main indications where which points it to be in favor of total parotectomy total parotectomy are you aware about european so salivary gland society classification for doing a parotectomy uh, yes ma'am it was uh, it came out in 2016 and uh, they have arbitrarily divided the uh, parotid into uh, five areas uh, by passing a line from the tragus to uh, midway between the ala and the angle of mouth and uh, in that they divided into four five zones 1 2 3 and 4 uh, one and two one is uh, upper uh, lateral or upper superior two is uh, lower superior superficial superficial, superficial. Uh, three is inferior deep four is uh, inferior uh, uh, superior deep and fifth is accessory and according to this they have uh, mainly broadly classified parotidectomy surgery parotid surgeries into uh, parotidectomy with involve with identific uh, identification of the facial nerve and uh, also removal of any of these four uh, five areas and the other is extra capsular dissection uh, which does not identify the facial nerve and uh, there is less than one area uh, less than one of these areas uh, dissected so they are called as a levels and they are divided into five so you have superficial divided into two level 1 and 2 the deep divided into the deep inferior that is three and the deep superior that is four and the accessory okay and additional whatever you remove you need to add it to the, the, the numbers this okay. was this system a modification of a previous system so the, in the previous system uh, they have changed the 3 and 4 initially 3 uh, uh, was uh, uh, upper deep and 4 uh, was uh, lower deep so they in the recent What? classification they have changed it do you feel it is useful or it just a kind of a one more classification it just to it's a fancy thing are you using it your center Um, uh, we are uh, uh, following the previous classification from superficial parotidectomy or total parotidectomy and extended uh, uh, total parotidectomy. So, what is your opinion? Is it useful? Nobody will help us. Anything? Any thoughts about that? I feel it is useful, ma'am. It's just a nomenclature, basically, to have a uniformity. to understand what we have done and to label it properly but having said that it thing which will give you a uniformity otherwise uh, we are still not using it. let me be frank about it but i feel it is useful we should be writing it down what we are doing right okay great any other question vidya tari you want to ask her yeah. With regard, with regard to the parotid surgery, or anything to the neck dissection, um, do you want do you want to go ahead with the uh, why you want to tell about the levels of neck dissection for this particular patient? Uh, so, uh, again, this is a locally advanced high grade malignancy, so an N zero neck. So I would offer an elective neck dissection, clearing levels two to four, uh, two to five. 
and mm. and why would you want to resect the uh, you you said you wanted to keep preserve the facial nerve function uh so preoperatively uh, since the facial nerve functions are preserved i would uh, if intraoperatively the facial nerve is it could be dissected off the tumor then uh, i would like to preserve the facial nerve but uh, take consent for uh, post operative facial nerve palsy sir adjuvant treatment uh sir in this case again since it's a high grade uh, uh, malignancy locally advanced uh, i would uh, uh, go for a post op uh, radi radiation therapy to the parotid bed and the neck sir so well, i think we have gone to adjuvant but there are many questions i would like to ask before adjuvant but let's complete this adjuvant radiotherapy part what will be the indication in a salivary gland to give a adjuvant radiotherapy we um, adjun chemo radiotherapy to this patient and anything about that yes ma'am uh, ma'am all uh, uh, resected adenoid cystic carcinomas uh, high grade uh, tumors locally advanced t3 t4 uh, uh, node positive next with positive margins uh, uh, we should offer, uh, they have to undergo post op uh, rt so where you will not give a rt tell me that that's much simpler intermediate uh, or low grade uh, neoplasias no no intermediate low grade low grade low grade, 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 grade t1 t0 neck t1 t2 all uh, these yes so low grade histology t1 t2 tumors and n0 uh, malignancies you will not give a adjuvant treatment provided your all surgery is good for the patient If you don't have any margin involved or anything. It's all clear margin. The whole tumor has to be removed. So, uh, you said local flap for this patient. So, what kind of a local flap you will do for this patient, and what are the options for the recall? Oh, ma'am. Uh, I. Uh, we, uh, for this case we can do a supra clavicular or a delto pectoral flap and a distal uh, pedicle uh, pectoralis major myocutaneous flap and why not a submental flap submental flap also a submental flap also if it is an n0 neck then we can plan for a submental flap you are in any ways not going to handle level 1a yes. right yes sir how how will you manage the facial palsy Uh, so intraoperatively and also yes, postoperatively yes sir uh, intraoperatively uh, if uh, we, uh, there is uh, facial nerve palsy sir we'll see whether there is any uh, stump uh, proximal stump available and uh, if the injury is a small segment we can do a primary anastomosis with 80 nylon and if uh, the primary anastomosis is not possible then we can do uh, cable grafting or nerve transfer Uh, with the greater auricular or uh, hypoglossal or nerve to masseter muscle, and also uh, lateral tarsography uh, to be done uh, in the uh, to prevent uh, uh, dryness in the post-operative period, uh, followed by facial rehabilitation and uh, if required then gold weight uh, gold weight implants to prevent uh, dryness. Okay, so this is. Um... My question is: When somebody asks you how you will manage facial nerve intraoperatively, first thing you will preserve it, then you will cut it. Okay. Yes. Sir. First, you have to talk about how you will preserve it and safeguard it in a recurrent case. So that was my first explanation. I had to give that to be the first thing. And if if i cut it because of the disease process and all that and then you will say whatever you know about the patient okay. intraoperatively ma'am following just a, just a small section extremely sorry uh, the photo which is there on the screen shows us that the tumor is actually sitting on to the masseter muscle yes, plus if you see the pre operative in the sense like the pre op photograph of the patient yes, you realize sir. the location of the tumor Yes, sir. Now, looking at both of these, you have to decide which part of the facial nerve is going to be involved. Is it the stump? Is it the proximal part where it's going to branch, or is it the distal uh, small nerves, the terminal branches, which we are going to encounter? Since it is a redo case, 
again all the more reason that we need to identify the nerves first so scans will tell you which part of the nerve is going to get affected and where it's going to be dicey taking the tumor off okay yes, and sir. we do itself will tell you that you need some adjuvant in the intraoperative yes, uh, in the ot where you'll be able to identify the nerve branches well yes sir so now with these two things answer your question uh, so uh, since it's a redo case and uh, uh, intraoperative uh, patient nerve monitoring uh, uh, should be used to identify the patient nerve correct okay Then, some benefit sorry ma'am is it of any benefit any uh, studies anything you know about this patient nerve monitoring in parotid surgery any benefit or a good ma surgery is good enough and two surgery is good ma'am there are few papers which say that in case of uh, recurrent or re redo cases uh, of intraoperative patient of uh, monitoring uh, is useful uh, as an adjunct to the Uh, clinical and uh, surgical identification of the nerve. So, how do you surgically identify the nerve? Um, so there is uh, various uh, uh, surgical landmarks for the facial nerve. Uh, first being the tragal pointer. Uh, the facial nerve will be lying uh, one centimeter deep and medial to the tragal pointer. Uh, second is the tympanomastoid uh, suture line, which is a bony landmark, and the facial nerve is around six to eight millimeters deep to it. and uh, also uh, it lies anterior to the posterior belly of digastric so uh, these are the few uh, intraoperative uh, surgical landmarks so in this particular patient how would you approach the facial nerve would you go from the stump or you go retrograde or anti grade uh, would you, what would you be your plan uh, sir i'd uh, like to go uh, from the proximal stump only because uh, the chances of injury to the Uh, facial nerve are higher when we are doing a retrograde uh, dissection, okay. and uh, use an intraoperative nerve monitor uh, uh, also for the identification of the nerve. So, so do you want to back up? You said that retrograde will have a more uh, nerve palsy rate. Do you have a review literature to back up? Uh, Ma'am, I'm uh, not sure about the exact uh, paper, but. Uh, Well, there are studies which show that a uh, retrograde dissection will lead to higher chances of uh, nerve injury there are meta analysis which will say that the retrograde is the least uh, kind of a possible you will get it okay but uh, having said that i agree with you somewhat because in this case it will be a difficult kind of a task so better and safer will be going from the thicker nerve to the thinner nerves and identifying with the uh, meter the now uh, the thinner nerves at the masseter level and then identify and take your deeper cuts for this patient the base will be very important for this patient where it will be adherent to the muscles what would you use for a nerve graft what are the nerves would you think intraoperatively if you have to sacrifice and you have to you can primarily primarily close uh, primarily anastomose but if you have to use a graft what are the nerve grafts would you think about uh, so one uh, possible option is the greater auricular nerve uh, since it lies in the vicinity of the uh, uh, facial nerve uh, other option is a uh, hypoglossal jump hypoglossal nerve uh, uh, jump graft and uh, other option is sural nerve also we can use to the nerve to the masseter uh, For the will you use a nerve to the masseter, or will you use a masseter for dynamic reconstruction? Whenever we are talking about facial nerve and uh, facial reanimation, reanimation is always divided into static and dynamic. Correct. Yes, yes sir. So, uh, whenever you want to do a dynamic reconstruction, what would you use? that's what i think probably sir was planning to ask you so the now to the masseter with the cuff of the muscle okay so you you can use um, i like uh, so i was saying you can use a masseter you can use a temporalis uh, yes. sling and uh, if if later on if you want to think of the benign tumor then you can do all the cross face nerve grafts and the gracilis free flap but if it's a malignancy you just want to you know um, if, uh, put in a small cravel graft and cover the skin and then you need to wait for radiation to take uh, uh, adjuvant therapy also right 
Yes, so sir. we won't do too much on facial uh, nerve reanimation during the primary surgery, unless you can do something quick. So when will you sacrifice the nerve? Uh, sir, intraoperatively, if uh, the nerve is involved, uh, the it cannot be shaved off from the tumor, or uh, it is going through a, the it is going through and through the tumor. And also, if preoperatively the patient is having facial nerve palsy. So would you do a frozen section? Can yes, you do a intraoperative frozen section. Uh, we can send the perineurium uh, to see if it is uh, involved by the tumor. Suppose the facial stump comes positive. Yes, ma'am. Nerve is involved at the trunk level, the main trunk itself. Okay. So what you will do? Um, I, would, I would still like to... Uh, dissect the nerve from the tumor and try to preserve uh, the nerve if possible. I'm saying it is involved, it is infiltrating at the trunk level, the main trunk, mm -hmm. and it exits from the stylomastoid foramen. So what you will do? And you will send the tissue very new, uh, you will send the tissue in and around the trunk area and it has come positive. Mm -hmm. um. In that case, we'll have to sacrifice the proximal stump. Correct. You need to sacrifice the now, but the tissue near that stump has come positive. So what you will do? Post -operative, yeah. No, no, no. The question ma'am is asking you is that you have got a stump at the stylomastoid exit of the now. The stump is positive for malignancy or cut the now. Then what is your further plan of action? At the stylomastoid foramen. Will you extend your surgery to do something else? To uh, in, more proximal nerve? Uh, uh, lateral temporal bone uh, resection. So you will do the drilling basically. You will try, drill you will yeah. drill the mastoid and you will look for the stump so that you can get a more extra stump so that you will have a negative margin on the facial nerve. Do you agree with me? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, isn't it difficult? Is it difficult, or I think it is the ending time. That's why you can try to chase the nerve all the way up as much as you can. Yeah, so you will actually will look into the vertical uh, segment of the facial nerve, and you will drill it out, and you will see that you get that stump negative, and that's a very important thing in a uh, parotid tumor. So you should not hesitate. To drill. So you it becomes important that you have a FNSE which is a high grade, you know imaging wise. So you have to take a consent from the patient pre-operatively that you may drill the patient. So you should have everything ready for this patient. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Do all uh, all these kind of uh, maneuvers, right? So anything uh, you will do, what are the complications of, uh, uh, do you want to discuss about the incision in a standard incision for the parotid uh, surgery? Uh, Ma'am, the standard incision we uh, use is the modified Blair's incision. What is the modification of the mod Blair? Uh, Ma'am, the Blair's, uh, the initial incision was given by uh, Blair, which was a vertical incision and it was used for draining of the parotid abscess. The modification that was given by Bailey was uh, it uh, extended from the root of the helix uh, uh, curved at the ear lobule up to the angle of the uh, uh, curved along the angle of mandible to the mastoid and along the first cervical crease. So maybe there was some zygomatic parallel incision also which was also got modified with the modified blair. So what we use is, is the modified blair incision and there are many other incision, uh, incisions can be used for the parotid surgery. So what will be the complication of the parotid surgery and how you tackle it? Uh, Ma'am, uh, one complication is the patient of uh, paralysis. It could be temporary or uh, permanent and uh, uh, one uh, tackling the paralysis, one is uh, doing a lateral tarsography uh, uh, to prevent dryness of the eyes and uh, physical rehabilitation and uh, gold weight implants in case... Uh... I, I didn't get one sec, one sec. So you are saying that patient got a temporary, means you have anatomically preserved the facial uh, nerve and patient got a palsy post-operatively. So you will put a gold implant and tarsography for this patient 
mama temporary tarsorophy can be done uh, okay till there is the rehabilitation of the uh, so is it depends on the grade of a facial palsy what you are having and how you handle it what what you will do uh, or upfront if there is a any kind of a palsy you will just put a do the temporary tarsorophy you don't know because patient has not got up from the anesthesia so you don't know how what is the uh, a uh, palsy uh, grade of this uh, patient uh, what is the medical line of management the basic things what we do and how you decide when you do tarsorephy what is bell's phenomena are you aware what is bell's phenomena uh, ma'am uprolling of the eyeball uh, when the patient is trying to close the eyes there is incomplete closure and uprolling of the eyeball what what suppose patient has got a good bell's phenomena patient has got a absent bell's phenomena so is is it going to help you to decide whether you want to do a tarsorephy for temporary for this patient where the facial nerve is intact intraoperatively what is bell's that. phenomena basically is the cornea has been protected it's protected basically when the patient is try to close his eyes at least there is a uprolling so cornea get pro uh, protected so there is a least chance of a corneal ulceration so you can do a normal using the lacqui gel or any kind of a lubricant you can use it and tape the eye in during the sleeping time so that is good enough you don't need to do the a uh, temporary tarsorephy also for the patient if you are preserved and you are just suspecting it is only a temporary phenomena but if it is a permanent phenomena and patient doesn't have a good bell's phenomena there is a risk of corneal ulcer then you will certainly will do some kind of a uh, small surgeries to protect the eye okay yes ma'am that will be the answer for the when you will do the procedure right Um, any other uh, other complications uh, uh, there is also chance of uh, fray syndrome and uh, uh, salivary fistula mm -hmm. formation so what is fray syndrome uh, ma'am fray syndrome is uh, also called gustatory uh, sweating uh, wherein uh, uh, the patient has sweating over the parotid region uh, on uh, salivation and that is because of the synkinesis uh, due to the aberrant uh, uh, parasympathetic uh, innervation to the Uh, skin uh, of the parotid uh, so the, uh, uh, secretomotor fibers from the auricular temporal nerve uh, will uh, be syn uh, synkinetically joining the uh, sympathetic fibers to the uh, uh, parot uh, skin of the parotid so on uh, 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 salivation there will be sweating over the parotid region not in this case but how do you prevent fray syndrome during uh, surgery so during surgery uh, raising a thick uh, uh, flap will prevent uh, fray syndrome and also if there is a uh, if there are thin uh, flaps then we can use a, a, a stenomastoid flap uh, for uh, soft tissue uh, over the area parotid yes sir. there are many other options are there which is the best option what, what is the best method to prevent the fray syndrome anything you know from the literature i'm um, to prevent or to treat i'm sorry prevent okay you tell both how to treat how to prevent which ever is easier first ma'am prevention uh, is by raising a thick flap uh, that's the one way so yes. you go in a plane properly so oh, yes. that you have a thicker flap but sometimes if there is a third dimension if you want to take a uh, kind of a margin then you may have to do a thin flap purposely to have a good soft tissue on the tumor okay then uh, in that case we'll uh, uh, use a flap like stenomastoid flap to uh, give a coverage over the uh, any other parotid. options any other options temporal is uh, temporal fascia can you use more? yeah so people are more happy with the temporoparietal fascia using or using a allograft and any other kind of uh, uh, this thing fat also been used so many other options are there so if you get a fray syndrome then what you will do um uh, first and foremost will uh, reassure the patient that it is nothing uh, serious and uh, 
uh, we can give them anticholinergic and anti uh, perspirants to prevent sweating over that area mm. if the patient is patient comes to you and patient uh, asks the treatment for it then what kind of a treatment you will give a um, uh, local uh, anti perspirants and uh, anti cholinergic not very fitting oh. and patient has got a side effect of these all drugs a tympanic neurectomy can be done okay any other options nowadays we have got everything people hit it with only one any medical management injections regularly uh, botox injection okay. yeah so people give botox botox is used for many many purposes so this is one of the best one maybe the patient will get some relief and it may be a short term or a long term depending on how much units you give and all that so it's a very useful thing for a kind of a very um, very embarrassing situation for a patient when they cannot eat in a public because they are sweating so sometime a bad a phrase syndrome where patient comes up with a problem then maybe a botox will help a type a kind of a toxin will help in this case. how do we give botox injection pump yeah <laughs> there is a there is a you do you know about start start iodine test uh, so start iodine test is uh, we'll first paint the area with uh, iodine mm -hmm. and uh, sprinkle uh, starch and uh, on uh, when the patient is salivating that uh, area will turn purple due to the reaction uh, with the sweat and so you mark that grid and you give botox there that's what you do so that's how you identify that part yes sir do you give steroids to the patient suppose patient has got a palsy any use for giving steroids we were used to give steroids when i used to do mastoids do you want to give steroids here is there any help <laughs> no help um, i don't know uh, no uh, role ma'am of steroids in post op yeah so when we used to do a uh, master that was a closed canal where there used to be a facial edema in a closed compartment and the bony canal that's why we used to give steroid thinking that it is decreasing the edema but here the main problem with the facial palsy is because of the traction So the steroids has not shown even the small RCTs and the meta analysis has not shown any benefit. Any type of a steroid, whichever type you are giving, yes, yeah. so no use of giving the steroids. You know the weight of the goal weight, how much you put? Uh, uh we uh, uh start with point two and uh, serially point two grams and serially uh, increase the weight depending upon the closure and requirement. usually 1.6 to 1.8 grams but there's a test for it you can look up yes sir basically you have to start with the dummy uh, implants okay and dummy implant and you have to start increasing and you have to see the bare minimum where the eyelid drops down and that will be a crucial cut off then that will be the your ideal weight what you will use it for the patient as a permanent then you will take the 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 final one the dummy you will be using only for the trial to know which one is suitable for the patient right yes ma'am and any any why gold why can't be any other metal so in earth metal there is no reaction uh, there is no tissue reaction why we do a superficial parotectomy in most of the parotid surgeries and uh, not the deep loop if it is a, like a mucoepidermoid why we clear off superficial parotidectomy what is the premises of doing superficial parotidectomy what is the basic uh embryological basis when you have a malignancy we, we say that we should do a superficial parotidectomy and whenever there is a high grade we say we should remove the superficial and the deep lobe also I'm not sure, ma'am. 
do you uh, you have heard about intraparotid lymph nodes yes uh, in intraparotid lymph nodes are more in the superficial lobe and okay right to the deep lobe so what will happen if you have tumor malignancy where the lymph node, uh, the the spread will go what will be the eclons after the tumor where it will go into the intra uh, into the intraparotid nodes and uh, from yeah. there into the cervical uh, lymph nodes no? yeah so you want to clear up the first eclon okay so suppose the patient comes with the intermediate grade mucopedermoid carcinoma so do you do anything so to represent like do you do a neck dissection what you do how you manage the neck Uh, ma'am, in that case, we can do an intraoperative frozen section of the node, and if the node is uh, positive, we can move to which level node? Uh, ma'am, level one, uh, level two node. Yeah. So you will do a superficial parotectomy to take care of the intraparotid lymph nodes, and to take care of the cervical lymph node, you may do a lymph node uh, sampling from level two, which is just next to your parotid incision. and you can take a help of frozen session if it is available and uh, you can do the sampling from that area and if that is positive then you will extend your neck dissection uh, but at the same time you will have your imaging everything in a place so you are surely ruled out that there is no other nodes otherwise you can do a upfront in a node positive you can do a neck dissection for the patient right So did we operate this patient? And if yes, what was the final HPR? Uh, sir, so we have dated uh, this patient for surgery, so we not yet uh, operated her. Okay. So last question from my side. Just imagine this turns out to this has uh, an adenoid cystic carcinoma with the local features as what is being seen in the MRI, and on the NCCT thorax, you will get a single, say about one point five by one point five centimeter node. Yes, sir. How would that change your treatment plan? Because this was apparently one of the first questions in the chat box. Uh, sir, uh, adenoid cystic uh, usually produces indolent. Uh, it's an indolent uh, biology. So if we have an uh, oligo metastatic uh, disease, uh, there are less than uh, five uh, metastatic lesions, and the primary is under control, and uh, the lesion is resectable, then we can do a, a metastatectomy of the lesion. Okay, so oligometastatic disease, we will do metastatic tomes. So what are the funda principles of metastatic tomy? Uh, so the primary should be uh, under control, and the uh, lesion okay. should be resectable, and uh, okay. and your surgery should not be morbid. Yeah, a surgery should not be morbid. Yes. Okay, and vis-a-vis -vis, this patient presents with both a bone met and a lung met. Now, how would you approach it? Uh, sir, in that case, uh, we can give them uh, uh, cytotoxic treatment uh, if there is disease progression uh, of more than twenty percent, and uh, there is uh, impairment, and there is threat to the organ uh, function. Uh, My question is: In a case with an adenoid cystic carcinoma proven, with his having locally advanced disease but resectable. Has got a bone met and has got a lung met. Will we uh, operate? If we operate, will we sacrifice the facial lung? Uh, sir, if it's a resectable lesion, will uh, we we'll, uh, do the surgery uh, uh, with sacrifice uh, with uh, by sac and also sacrifice the facial lung and uh, metastatectomy for the lung lesion and uh, if required, with uh, postoperative uh, uh, systemic therapy uh, can be given, sir. Okay. so uh, i just disagree a little bit about the facial nerve sacrifice so it will on the merit basically so if it is infiltrating you will sacrifice it but having said that patient has got a bony met and a lung met a lone lung met oligo met different story but when the patient has got a bony met it has gone to one more station so i will be not adding a morbidity to this patient if i can preserve a patient now which is preserved means it's not infiltrated i will preserve it and bony metastasis again you might give a kind of a local radiotherapy to this bony metastasis and if it is only a single bony metastasis not having much 
then you can always think about a later date a resectability if it is a resectable kind of a bony area and um, you will look at the dfi of the patient when they come up later date you will look at the number of the lung nodules less than 5 and all that so you will see how is the biology of this patient is doing you will observe that this patient is doing well with a static disease then you will go for a metastatectomy so it all depends on how and even a grade of adenoid cystic carcinoma matters there are three grades if the patient has got a more solid component more than a 30% this patient is more likely to have a aggressive disease and more going to have a aggressive biology so you i will do a for a grade 1 i will be more of doing more surgeries but grade 3 i will be less doing the surgeries and maybe a backup will be a medical line of a management for the patient when it comes as a aggressive tumor so you have to keep a mind that the surgery is the foremost important thing but when we fail and we cannot offer a uh, a surgery then you go for a kind of a chemotherapy or a, any kind of a site targeted therapy and depends you can do some kind of a molecular uh, targeted Uh, uh markers and which will direct so that you can give those kind of a treatment to this patient apart from that there are some uh, radiotherapy different you can try so there are fast because salivary gland per se is a different biology than the squamous cell you can use a different neurons carbon ion protons everything can be used and there are good result also but the the availability is the issue for that so unresectable you can still give a kind of radiotherapy to this patient and there are good result has been shown few of the studies have shown very good result yes yeah. ravi asim are you there how much more time we have I'm as long as we can go. Uh, Miss, I can ask question whole night. I can ask, but there must be some time. And maybe Ankit or Vidya Dharan and Swagni can ask more questions if they have anything more to discuss about this case. I can. We've been grilling her for the past one hour. More than a little bit more than that. She's been answering. Uh, kind of huh? She's been answering very nice. Yeah. Swagnik, are you there? Yes, ma'am. Very much. Anything you want to ask? I, I, I am lear learning. Question. I am learning from the excellent discussion. Do you want to ask any questions to her, or we can uh, take any chat box? Any question, Ravi? You want to ask yes. any question from the chat box? Any burning question? Any bread? We can ask. ask her. In chat box, some requests has come from Prashant Babu sir to continue the discussion. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, with, with regard to parotid malignancy, I think we have covered most of the points. But salivary yeah. gland malignancy in minor cell, a lot of other things are there. But uh, we can keep going on. <laughs> so I think, man, most of the things which have been, which qu queries which have been asked in the chat box have been discussed in the discussion part. Uh, there was one discussion about bone metastasis versus uh, lung metastasis that also part has been covered just now. I think all the questions have been already answered in the discussion, ma'am. Any recent advances in the surgery, ma'am? Uh, uh, robotic surgery and endoscopic assisted uh, arteriectomy. Yeah, so that is a recent advances because you people do get this kind of uh, paper and that questions will be there. So please do read about it. Okay, so. there are few studies so please read about endoscopic or a robotic approach and the patient satisfaction scores and all that with the good incisions which are used for right hysterectomy and all that please read that on those things right yeah. also for the exam you can actually look into the uh, translocation patterns the genetic translocation patterns molecular yes sir there are the mammary analog secretory carcinoma yes, has yes. a specific uh, 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 rearrangement The mucoepidermoid has one. 
So that is probably one of the few questions which ask because they are not just uh, diagnostic. They also help in prognosticating as well as in future some therapeutic interventions could come up. Also for exams, you need to know the grading systems for uh, mucoepidermoid carcinoma, adenoid cystic carcinoma, parotid, I, I think pleomorphic as Seifert's classification. So these would be important for your exams. Right, sir. And, what uh, is the recurrence uh, rate in a procedure you do it for a parotid? Suppose you do the e nucleation, you do a extra capsular dissection, you do a superficial parotidectomy versus you do a total parotidectomy. Any ideas? Um, the recurrence rates are higher with the e nucleation and extra capsular dissection. Uh, I'm not sure about the number. Possibly. Yeah, it's a good general knowledge, basically. So <laughs> you will have. Uh, if you do a enucleation, there are high chances of having recurrences upwards of like 14%. You can have it. As you go and do a total paratidectomy, um, you will have the less. So it will be like a less than a 2%. Two, two, uh, 2%. Two but having said that, more the extent of the surgery, more chances of a complication with the facial palsy. So the recurrence is one thing and the Policy rates are the different. So extent of the surgery will add to the facial policy because you're going to handle more nerves and all that. So uh, that is the thing. What about using the instruments? The, the adjunct used to do the parotid dissection. What are the options? Are you aware of that? Uh, bipolar uh, pottery for dissecting the parotid. We can also use Liga uh, har harmonic scalpel. Uh, there is no uh, significant difference between the two methods. Uh, it's uh, mostly operator dependent. Any time? Sorry, ma'am. You have seen or uh, used any time? Ma'am, we use harmonic scalpel uh, routinely in our surgeries. Okay. So how it helps? Do you feel that you have got a less work to do when you are using the? This kind of a gadgets for bulky lesions. Uh, for bulky lesions, harmonic scalpel we find is uh, useful, but otherwise there is no uh, significant. So there is no difference as such, but it will reduce your operating time when you use a lagashuar. Okay, that's what study says. Right. Okay. Any more questions from anybody? Which parotid tumors would you target for hormonal therapy? Uh, sir, uh, salivary duct carcinomas, uh, which are HER2 new uh, positive. Okay. And any uh, tumors which have specific markers for targeted therapy? Sir, mammary uh, I'm not sure, sir. Okay. E have you heard of EGFR? So some of the uh, mucopidomoid and uh, some salivary ductal can also have EGFR expression, yes. but I don't know about the, uh, but the trials are not confirmed in that. Yes. So androgen receptors, basically you need to look at also. And there are many important things, newer things are come up. So you have many uh, translocation studies, uh, NTRKs are the most newest one in the thing where the translocation in the fusion genes are seen. I think that is very interesting actually. So uh, if I want to give a CTRT to this patient, yes, justified to give a CTRT for this patient? What are the out of the trial settings? Actually, there is only one trial which is going on. That is the RTOG 1008 trial. And the results are not yet uh, published. So out of the trial setting, uh, uh, chemotherapy with radiation has not yet been recommended. So till the trial comes, you are not going to give a CTRT to this patient? It's not My recommended out of the... Just stopped approval. I think we are going to get a result soon. Um, the phase two results have come and they uh, they show that there is a, a better progression-free survival with uh, concurrent chemo RT, but 
uh, that has been just presented and not published yet so uh, ncsd uh, database has shown that the concurrent chemo radiotherapy has shown a detrimental result so that's why people are not so keen to add chemotherapy to the patient just what what we add to the uh, squamous cell carcinoma so but having said that for this patient maybe a chemotherapy opinion you can take it maybe this patient we may add a chemotherapy because this patient has got a high grade tumor patient has got a masseter involvement patient has got a recurrent i may not be uh, surprised that it comes as a carcinoma xpo autism so in that situation maybe i may add and take a opinion from the medical oncologist whether i want to add a chemotherapy and i will certainly will have a distinct metastatic workup for this patient uh, so i i feel it will come as a very high grade tumor i will rule out and even on a follow up i will follow up this patient with a uh, uh, imaging to check very for the recurrences a local regional and the distant also yes ma'am what is the margin in a parotid surgery ma'am ma'am one centimeter between the upper buccal and the lower buccal but the tumor is very close it's like if i am using a magnification i can just see one plane and just below that there is a tumor patient didn't have the facial nerve palsy and um, it is a mucopidermoid carcinoma per primum case uh, in that case ma'am i would try to preserve the nerve but still uh, if it is close then i would take the uh, so i got the plane using the i got a magnification i have used and i got the got the plane above the buccal branches and where tumor was stuck but i could take it out but i was not sure that this margin is good enough in Maybe that case uh, we can give the uh, we, we have the option of giving a post op rt mam for close margin so what you do will you take a margin of the no we might take a close margin and uh, offer the patient the post op radi radiotherapy and preserve the facial no yeah so whenever you have a good mark if you get a plane between the tumor and the nerve and if you are clean on that margin and the patient has got a facial nerve intact pre operatively you do not sacrifice the nerve just to get that a uh, margin of 4.5 or 1 cm there is no number when it comes to the facial nerve okay the number is for the soft tissue in and around and in that area but when it comes to the facial nerve if there is a plane a good plane you can just save the nerve and give a adjuvant radiotherapy to this patient but if the nerve is infiltrating into the nerve then you can sacrifice that particular branch and the that segment and you can do the anastomosis or you can do a cable graft for that nerve and you will try to sacrifice the least important branches of the patient so that will be the dictum when it comes to the facial nerve and the margins on the nerve because that's a very normal phenomena which happens intraoperatively you have to make a decision what you want to do right yes ma'am what about the greater auricular nerve anything you want to tell us about greater auricular nerve during the parotid surgery Uh, mom the greater auricular nerve is the uh, first neurostructure that we identify while raising the planes it has an anterior and a posterior branch what is and the value of the greater auricular nerve what are your complexes it what is the root value of the greater auricular nerve mom c2 c2 yes c3 c2 c3 mom right okay so tell us about greater auricular nerve 
Uh, ma'am, it uh, oh, it lies over the sternocleidomastoid upper one third, so it has an anterior and a posterior branch. So, uh, during a parotid surgery, as far as possible, we should try to uh, preserve the greater auricular, and it, if it has to be sacrificed, we should try to preserve the posterior branch, which goes to the ear lobe. Right. In my book, there are four branches. So you have got two correctly, the anterior and posterior. Addition to that, there is a lobular and there is something called as an anterior inferior. So people say that you should preserve whichever goes to the lobular and whichever comes anteriorly. If a, a pathology requires or a warrants, you can sacrifice that. So the lobular and the posterior, if you preserve, the mainly the lobular, then patient will have a sensation to the lower lobe of the uh, yeah. lobule. Yeah. So that should be done. Okay? Yes, ma'am. But if you see, it does not make any difference for the patient satisfaction. So it really does not make any uh, difference. But if you should preserve whichever is not involved and which is not required by, uh, by, uh, uh, by oncological reasons. Okay? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. How do you prevent the neuroma of the great auricular nerve? So shaving uh, uh, the nerve uh, elliptically and a sharp cut instead of. Uh... You try not to not to uh, damage the nerve too much all around it, and the second thing is, you, if the stump, you can try to push it towards the deeper tissue end than towards the skin. Right. I think. So, which is the best landmarks to identify the nerve? Uh, Ma'am, tragal pointer is the uh, best landmark, landmark, but the most consistent bony landmark is the tympanomastoid suture line. Okay. Which one do you use? Do you use tragal pointer? When I was in ENT, when I was doing my first parotid, that time I used to use tracheal pointer. I was very fascinated by that. When I came to doing, started doing a neck dissection, the posterior belly of digastric became my friend. And uh, because I used to do a sampling for the level two first, so started liking the posterior belly landmark. And then I realized these all landmarks, if you use it all together, not like an individual landmark, it helps you more to identify the facial nerve, especially when the, uh, the, the tumor distorts the anatomy. Then it helps you. You cannot have only one single landmark that which you will use it. You will use all the landmarks together in that valley of the nerve and that area you will identify the facial nerve. Ravi? Yes, ma'am. I'm finished with all questions, I think. Anybody, mm -hmm. Ankit or Swapni, can ask any question more. I can go on. No, ma'am. She has answered all questions well. Yeah, she she will be cursing me in the night that I know, but I think she will bless me when she gives her exams. Uh, I also learned so much from the discussion, ma'am. Thank you so much. Yes, ma'am. Wonderful discussion, actually. Uh, before we end the session, would you whether I would invite all the examiners to get some comment on uh, Japanese performance as how was it? And anything for us? I think Madam and Shwabik Sara and uh, uh, Sir uh, Vidya Sir are the correct people to guide them. I was still a resident, so no. Madam and Shwabik Sir and Vidya Sir give the ratings. You go first. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I wanted to tell she presented very well, um, I think in the second part. The first part, the clinical examination and the negative history, I wasn't so happy. The other thing is she presented and whatever explanation or our question answer session, she was good, but there is lack of a literature backup. I think in parotid, it's a very small focused area. There are a few things only you need to read.
so i think you, if you back up with little bit review of literature your all uh, answers it will help you out to give you a robust answer when you are answering the examiner so i will say i will give you 7 and a half okay and the 2.5 you have to improve you got a distinction 7.5 okay thank you you stand the fence so please read up okay yes ma'am and add read everything uh, i don't know about how you have a paper so you have a thyroid and the parotid paper i think it's a paper four if i'm not wrong i don't know how it goes for you also so in thyroid lots of things to read parotid very limited literature very limited information if you read everything you can't lose a single mark on a parotid okay so please read up all the review of literature and update yourself now so that in that paper if we have a 50% parotid questions and 50% thyroid questions or whatever way you will crack at least the parotid questions okay so that should be done and write down read it up there are few data only you just need to know few things you will be up to date with all the things with that i am i think um, you have covered almost everything um, if if at all uh, sanskriti doc sanskriti's uh, talk was pretty comprehensive she had a very updated thing on assessment so you could follow you know pick up all the latest papers from the presentation she gave today especially the milan uh you know diagnostic criteria and, and uh, also we are not dwelled too much into the theory of the you know the pathology about each tumor and what the prognosis madam just went through regarding the solid component of acc yes, and yes. Uh, yeah and the beauty of the, these vivas is it's with one day you don't you know completely know your full capacity but it it all depends on how you can lead the examiner and i know i know when we when we had uh, our exam we had dikru sir and i think we are we, we really don't know where to lead the dikru sir to any of these because sir knows everything in the in, the, in those kind of situations you know you know your strength for that case know your strength like madam said you know the articles well you will have to lead the examiner in that one or two hours and uh, make sure that you know uh, you do well in that but not not get stuck anywhere and um, yeah so uh, knowing a bit of salivary gland pathology the anatomy a lot of questions would come in anatomy and also the post op complication because that's what in real life when you when you're practicing you are all getting the degree to practice as a surgeon you need to handle the patients post operatively how you're going to handle your own complications and what to expect certain things and also the importance of you know adjuvant treatment so focus a bit on these things i know we'll all be focusing a lot on the 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 tumor and the staging and all that but Uh, generally and you did answer pretty well in all these situations yes focusing on negative history a little bit more so you can lead the examiner to where your strong points are and you can get a lot of points during the exam um so so yeah madam said the sound of same i'm a little bit more uh, lenient than maybe eight and uh, all the best to you and good luck so i think any from anything from you yeah very nice very nice presentation lot of things to learn but yes definitely there is scope for improvement as we all have but uh, very nice and comprehensive well done thank you thank you. thank you and i would like to thank all the examiners especially anuja ma'am for taking out so much of time for this session and giving uh, for such an elaborate discussion picking out every point discussing everything so thoroughly it was very informative for all of us as well and uh, obviously thank you vidya sir uh, swagnik sir and uh, dr ankit for coming uh, on this session tonight uh, this evening thank you so much thank you ma'am thank you so much for coming and thank you everyone thank you sir thank, thank, you. You. thank you thank you for having us very back to the olden days thank you so yes. much yes ma'am it was actually very fun ma'am very nice again learning from you and going through all that discussion part it was like reminding us of our morning classes how it used to used to go thank you so much ma'am thank you asim bye bye